This is Twit. Another piece of cool research uh, is is this whole question of uh, the the term is post quantum RSA, meaning okay, we have this sort of this uncomfortable sense that quantum computers are on the horizon. They're getting more capable. They're they're inching forward. It's a huge topic of research. Um, the question is. How will the presence of quantum computing impact present day encryption? So a bunch of academics, uh, Dan Bernstein being among them, I think there's three others, um, decided to really tackle this question. Um, so in the abstract of their paper, and I've got the link to the, the full PDF in the show notes for anyone who's interested, uh, they, they say this paper proposes RSA parameters for which key generation, encryption, decryption, signing, and verification are feasible on today's computers while own all known attacks are infeasible, even assuming highly scalable quantum computers. Okay, so... so that this paper proposes RSA parameters for doing everything RSA needs to do, which are now, and I'll <laughs> we'll look at this question of feasibility here at the, in, in a minute, because what they had to do, okay, feasible, maybe. But the point being that, that they've, they, they've looked at the question of, can we keep RSA? Is it possible to keep it even in the presence of, of highly capable quantum computers. So they said as part of the performance analysis, this paper introduces a new algorithm to generate a batch of primes. As part of the attack analysis, this paper introduces a new quantum factorization algorithm that is often much faster than Shor's algorithm. Uh, Peter Shor is a mathematician who famously, about 23 years ago, back in 94, he he described uh, how future quantum computers, as we assumed they were going to operate, could be put to the task of prime factorization. And this is one of the things that upset everybody, is it looks like, oh, crap, <laughs> quantum computers are going to be much better factoring machines than existing sequential machines that we have now. So... So Shor's algorithm is often cited as, you know, this classic example of, whoops, quantum computers are going to kill. Um, but in the process, Dan and his group came up with something even better, often, as he writes, they write much faster than Shor's algorithm um, and much faster than pre-quantum factorization algorithms. So, um, okay, so as we know, it's been the long-standing intractability of the integer factorization problem. That is the difficulty of determining the two prime number factors which comprise a public key, um, which is and, and that is the entire basis for RSA asymmetric key technology. In RSA, as we've discussed in the past, the public key is the product of two secret prime factors. And the reason a public key can be made public, even though it's it, like it got the secrets in it, it's got it's composed of two prime numbers that have been multiplied. That's all that the public key is. So. The reason the public key can be made public is that even knowing it, we do not currently know how to break it back apart into the two prime factors that were multiplied in the first place to obtain it. But so, you know, with factorization, this is a place where size matters. We know, for example, the prime factors of 35. That's not difficult. You know, we, any, any grammar school kid can tell you the prime factors of the number 35. 
But it's easy to do that only because there are not many possible prime factors smaller than 35 and not many possible solutions to it. This is not true when the products of primes are several thousand bits long. We know that primes are surprisingly common throughout the number space. They do not get less common sort of counterintuitively since a prime by definition is a number not divisible by anything smaller than it. You'd kind of think that as they would as they're getting bigger, they're just like so many numbers smaller than it that it would be increasingly difficult to find them. Turns out that's not the case. There's lots of them forever. Um, so as a consequence, as the, as the primes get really big, there are just too many possibilities. Um, and no one has found to date a highly efficient way on non-quantum computers to break apart a sufficiently lengthy product of two large primes. Thus, RSA stands. Although we have been inching the key, the public key size up. You know, we were at 1024 for a while. Now we're at 2048 and eventually we'll be at 4096 just because everybody likes powers of two. Um, so, you know, and and it, in fact, it's the it's the relative weakness of the factorization problem which accounts for the fact that, for example, an RSA public key needs to be 2048 bits long, whereas an elliptic curve public key, which uses a different hard problem, not prime factorization, it can be 256 bits long and with equal strength. So the essential question this paper seeks to answer is even assuming the presence of fast quantum factoring um, and and also while offering this new faster quantum factorization algorithm that they've called GEECM, um, under quantum factorization, how does the difficulty of usage that is using a given RSA public key how does the difficulty of using it scale relative to the difficulty of a practical attack using the um, uh, using prime even quantum factorization as the prime factors product length increases? Okay, so as we so we know, for example, a quantum computer could probably cut through today's 2048-bit public RSA public key without breaking a sweat. So they wanted to understand how RSA scales. That is, if we, if we need to make factoring much more difficult because quantum computers can factor much better than current-day computers. So, and for some reason, if we want to hold on to RSA... Um, how does it scale? So they asked the question, is it actually true that quantum computers will kill at RSA? And they write, the question here is not whether quantum computers will be built or will be affordable for attackers. This paper assumes that astonishingly scalable quantum computers will be built, making a what's uh, a a, a the, the term they use is qubit. That is the term. Making a qubit operation, a quantum bit Q -U, operation. Q-U-B-I-T, not, R right, not right. like the Q -U -B -I -T. biblical me measurement. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. As, as in a quantum bit operation, as inexpensive as today's bit operation. So they say, under this assumption, Shor's algorithm easily breaks RSA as used on the internet today. Yep dead. The question is whether RSA parameters, meaning prime lengths, can be adjusted so that all known quantum attack algorithms are infeasible while encryption and decryption remain feasible. So that's what I meant when I said, you know, how does it scale? Could we, can we keep growing the public key size so that, so that we could still use it, yet 
they it's like like quant, but very fast quantum computers can't crack it. So they write the conventional wisdom is that Shor's algorithm factors an RSA public key n almost as quickly as the legitimate RSA user can decrypt. So, okay, so it basically it really weakens the benefit. The point is that 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 using the key is is about the same level of difficulty or speed as cracking the key. So they say decryption uses an exponential modulo n. Shor's algorithm uses a quantum exponential exponentiation modulo n. There are some small overheads, they write, in Shor's algorithm, but these overheads create only a very small gap between the cost of decryption and the cost of factorization. The main finding of this paper is that standard techniques for speeding up RSA when pushed to their extremes do create a much larger gap between the legitimate user's costs and the attacker's costs, meaning the cost to attack increases much faster than the cost to use. So RSA could be kept alive kind of on life support uh, if it was like if we had no better solutions. Now, it's worth noting we've already got post-quantum crypto. We haven't talked about it yet on the podcast because, you know, qubits, there aren't a lot of qubits wandering around yet. None of us have them on our desks or in our, in our pockets or anything, but they're coming. And And so academia is ahead of this. So this is not you know, no one should misunderstand this as suggesting that it's practical or we will actually will be using RSA in a post quantum era. It's just sort of, you know, interesting research and I and I think useful research, too. So um, they say these extremes, that is the uh, pushing RSA to its extreme. These extremes require a careful analysis of quantum algorithms for integer factorization. As part of the security analysis, this paper introduces, and then they talk about this new quant, their own new faster quantum factoring solution. Um, and then finally, they say, we report initial implementation results. So they actually, you know, the rubber meets the road here. They they built this stuff with uh, you know under assumptions about what would happen if they said okay if quantum factorization ends up being essentially on par with current what does it mean so um they said and i had to do a double take on this but it's like wait what and finally they say we report initial implementation results for rsa parameters large enough that is remember long keys large enough to push all known quantum attacks above two to the one two to the power of 100 qubit operations right so like we're gonna we're gonna say that qubits are efficient so we're gonna force you to use a whole ton of them Two to the hundred. So this is very much like you know our the, the the numbers we're used to seeing. Two to the one twenty eight. Two to the two fifty six. Okay, this is two to the hundred qubit operations, making them again incredibly time consuming and thus impractical. So they say we report initial implementation results for RSA parameters large enough to push all known quantum attacks above two to the one hundred qubit operations. Now here it comes. These results include. Successful completion of the most expensive operation in post-quantum RSA. Namely, Lee, are you well centered over your ball? I am. The generation of an eight terabit public <laughs> key. I like it. Eight, <laughs> eight trillion bits. So, so the, the big ones now are 4,096 bits. So Yeah, yeah. We don't... We, we, we're, we're using 2048, you know, 2048, and that's just fine now. I think eight terabits, of even quantum computing might be hard pressed. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, as I said, this is not meant to. This is we're not suggesting that this is practical, but they're saying, okay, we just kind of wanted to go there. We wanted to say, okay, 
we got fast quantum factoring. How badly does this kill RSA? And the point is, okay, if for some reason you absolutely positively must use prime factorization as the hard, you still have to use it as the hard problem to solve, and nobody is suggesting that, but if you did, well, an 8 trillion bit public key, that would do the job. Of course, you know, it's <laughs> schlepping that around, communicating, and oh, and of course, one bit goes bad. I mean, it, it's difficult in today's storage environment even to reliably store an 8 trillion bit public key. It itself would have to have its own error correction, which would increase its size substantially just to protect against internal bits changing within the key, just sort of spontaneously, you know, for quantum reasons. So, yeah, at this point, uh, that's a problem. You know, there are all kinds of post-quantum crypto, which is ready to go. Uh, lattice te techniques are looking like they're they're becoming very popular, but there are there are, there's a handful of them. So I just thought this was was fun to say. Okay, uh, can we keep this thing alive? Well, yeah. Are, is anyone going to? Uh, no, we're going to be switching to different crypto when quantum uh, machines happen.